Hi class, it's Bill Berry here with an introduction to sorting algorithms. This is for the Java 1 class, but this is just a general introduction to sorting algorithms that is not code specific, so we could use it anywhere. By this point, as we start to look into arrays and get into the details of how we manipulate arrays, it is a very common thing to get into algorithms because when you're manipulating items in an array, there are certain things that are very typical to need to do. You need to sort things, you need to find mins and maximums of things, you need to search for things, and sorting algorithms are just a very typical part of that. Also, uh, as a computer science student, it's good to know these algorithms because they are very, uh, they're going to pop up here and there, and you're expected to kind of have an in-depth understanding of algorithms, and so studying sorting algorithms is a great, a great way to sort of experiment with algorithms, look into them, understand their complexities and uh, ins and outs and things like that. So all good stuff to study. So what we're going to do today then is to look at three sorting methods. The uh, three are bubble sort, selection sort, and insertion sort. Bubble sort we may not have actually studied, and while uh, it is sort of the uh, uh, the black sheep of the algorithm world, and uh, when, you know the, it does still have some merit, it's, it's still something that you'll see referred to, even if it's often referred to in a sort of a negative way. Uh, but it has some uh, some advantages in terms of letting us experiment and understand about algorithms. So uh, the fact that we can make optimizations to it is sort of a good mental exercise. So it's good to know. Selection sort was introduced if you took uh, CSC 110 with us. Uh, that was probably introduced to you in the Python class. And insertion sort is something that's new this quarter in our Java 1 class. But all three are interesting to know. We also want to discuss something that is very common terminology in the computer science world, especially when you're talking about algorithms, and that is measures of complexity, specifically the big O notation. That basically tells you how algorithms will scale as data gets bigger. So you want to have a sense of how complex my algorithms are. If I have a hundred items, that's very different from a thousand or a million items. And so uh, these these uh, algorithms do grow exponentially uh, when uh, when uh, things get bigger. So we want to understand big O notation, and that's again just common things that you're going to hear discussed. Now to practice this, what I'm using is playing cards. So I highly recommend to do these practices you do something tactile. Use playing cards, get index cards and write big numbers on them. Do something that you can actually physically sort in front of yourself. I just find that the tactile nature of this will help lock in the algorithms and help you to understand because if you can do it on uh, on those with those cards you can do it on an exam or you can do it in an interview you can explain how things work because you'll get the algorithm down. So let's just jump in and let's start and look at the bubble sort. Now the easy way to remember the bubble sort, each one of these will have a tagline to help you remember, but the bubble sort's idea is the biggest one bubbles to the top each time. So each pass through, what we're going to do is we're going to compare each pair of cards. So we're going to do four comparisons. We're going to start with the first two and say six and three, are they in order or out of order? Well, they're out of order, so we need to swap them. So I'm going to move the three over here and the six over here. They might not be beautifully placed doesn't matter. So we've done that swap. Now we look at the next two cards. Six and five, are they in order or out of order? And then we swap them. Six and two, still out of order. Swap them. Six and four, still out of order. Swap them. So we have now done one pass through, and each of these algorithms is going to have a concept of a pass, where you complete one look at each of the cards, or one look through, and that represents one pass. So at the end of this pass, what we know is that the biggest card, the six in this case, has bubbled up to the top of the list. That's really all we know, though. We don't really know anything about the positions of any of the rest of them, but we do know the biggest card bubbled up. All right, so now let's do our second pass. So we do the three and the five. They're in order. We don't need to swap them. Five and two, out of order. We need to swap. Five and four, out of order. We need to swap. Five and six, in order. Great. Second pass, we know that the second largest card has bubbled to the top. Now, we sort of accidentally got the 4 in place, too, uh, but depending on our algorithm, we may not actually, you know, how we write it, we may not actually know that yet, but we definitely know the 5 and the 6 have bubbled into place. Then we do the same thing again with the third pass, 3 compared to 2. 
All right, we swap, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, we swap those two. Okay, then we look at three and four, don't need swapping. Four and five, don't need swapping. Five and six, don't need swapping. So then, once we've done all of our passes, we know we've done one, two, three, four passes through this list. <clears throat> we know that the, all of these are going to be in order. So that's the essence of how the bubble sort works. Now let's look at a couple of things that we could do to be a little smarter, because right now <clears throat> we could certainly do this where we know we need to make four passes through because you know each one's going to compare one to the one greater, and each one we're going to have to look at four sets of cards. So we could figure out, you know, we can certainly write two loops, you know, two for loops that are going to cause that to happen because we know exactly how many times we need to go through this. But we can be a little smarter and that's what's the fun part about algorithms. Can you make them a little smarter, make them a little better? So here are three optimizations that we can do with the bubble sort. The first one is if we do a pass through the cards on any pass through, if we do no swaps, we know that we're done. So rather than having an outer loop that's a for loop, we can be smarter and say, look, we just need to continue doing this until we have no more swaps. And if we do that, we'll know we're done. And it might be very early, right? You might have them in order, in fact, to begin with. And then you just look through them. You don't need to make any swaps and you know you're done. Second optimization is, even if that's not the case, we don't need to go all the way through to the end. Remember, on the first example, we bubbled the six all the way up to the top, and then we know that that is, in fact, a sorted portion. So we have this concept of, we have a sorted portion and an unsorted portion of the list. So after the first two passes, we know that five and six are in place. We know those are sorted. We don't need to look at those again. So on the next pass, we need to look at these two and these two, but we don't need to venture into this territory because we know we're done with that portion. So that's another optimization is that we can move back one each time and not go to the end of the list. But interestingly here, let's look at what happens if we, um, if we now continue this sort, right? We're looking at the four and the three and we swap those and that's great. And we look at the four and the two and we swap those. Now, even if we had only done two passes, right? Let's say that we had only done one pass, so we were on the second pass. But notice we swapped these two, and then we didn't need to swap these two. The interesting thing is here, after the final swap that you've made, everything else must be in place. So even though if we were on the second pass, we didn't actually need to swap the four and the five, we noticed they're already in place because we checked them. So instead of growing our sorted portion by one card, it actually can grow by two cards. So the position starting at the last swap all right, you know, once you've made this swap, you know that everything from this point on is sorted. So these are great optimizations, and you can imagine how they would be written in code, and it's good, in fact, to code these things up. So that's the bubble sorts optimizations. Now, notice that because of the optimizations we just talked about, the best case for a bubble sort is actually one pass through. We have five cards, we need to do four checks. Two against three, in order. Three against four, in order. Four against five, in order. Five against six, in order. We've made one pass, we made no swaps, therefore we're done. So the best case really only took four comparisons. So therefore, knowing now what we understand about the bubble sort, is we can look at the worst case and the best case and figure out what the order is of the complexity, the big O notation. So in the worst case, which for the bubble sort is the thing completely sorted backwards, right, where you have five, four, three, two, one, or six, five, four, three, two, we know we have to do four passes. For each pass, we have to do one fewer of those, of, of the checks than that. So that's four plus three plus two plus one. That's 10 checks that we need to do, 10 comparisons. To describe that mathematically, that's n squared minus n, value uh, quantity over two or n squared over two minus n over two so we can double check ourselves to make sure that's right so 25 minus 5 is 20 over 2 is 10 so 10 checks that's exactly what we did now as the number of cards the number of array items gets bigger you'll notice that n squared grows so much faster than n 
So n actually isn't that significant to the thing. Really, n squared is the thing that is driving this. So for a million items, you know, n squared is so huge compared to the n of a million, uh, we we actually just don't care. So we basically drop the n and we just say, look, this is o n squared. This is big O notation n squared. The complexity of the worst case scenario for the bubble sort is big O of n squared. Okay, n squared complexity. Now, for the best case though, we have a different scenario. We, if we have the cards already in order as we did in the previous slide, when we simply have to make one pass through it. So we actually had n minus one checks. Again, as n grows, the minus one becomes insignificant. We don't really care. So we just call this big O n. This is a linear complexity, right? Big O sub n. So that's how big O notation works, and that's how it applies to the bubble sort. Now I'm going to break the video here, and then we're going to come back and look at the next two sorting algorithms and go through those quickly and talk about their big O notation as well. So thanks for watching, and please continue on to the next video.